Hello, and welcome to the Lend Hoping Nothing podcast. I'm Michael Humphreys, and I'm happy to be talking to you today. This is episode six, and today we're going to be talking about labor and wages. This is going to be a little bit shorter form than what I've done previously, and I'm going to call this segment a musing moment. And I hope my dry sense of humor comes in through that. So recently I've finished reading Laborum Exchurchens, and I will mispronounce that every time because I learned Latin to read it and not to speak it. So one of the things there uh, that I noticed was some of the insights that John Paul had. And I think the principal insight that he has is that the laborer is the primary efficient cause in the order of production. And I appreciate the way that he terms this as the primary efficient cause, because it kind of brings in this aspect of metaphysics, which helps me to start thinking about uh, what's going on. Because really the primary question I want to kind of think about is, what exactly are we paying for in wages? So the labor is this primary efficient cause. And so before moving into that, I, I want to make a, a little bit of a distinction because it's important to understand uh, something like a vendability or the ability to actually sell something to exchange it. And so what is required for exchange in the first place? So in order for something that is mine to become yours, it's necessary that it's alienated from me, that it's I, it can be separated from me so that it, it can become yours. So that's a sort of first principle or first requirement of being able to uh, exchange something. So one of the things we might then kind of notice is that, you know, when we talk about things like uh, selling our skills or things, we are not actually selling those as such. So things like our skills, our thoughts, our, our powers generally are not things that we can literally separate from ourselves and give them to someone else. So these are not vendable. So what exactly are we trying to sell? And John Paul makes a very important distinction between the, at least what's translated as the subjective and objective components of labor. And he, he's making this distinction, I think, to emphasize the, the importance of the person in labor. But I think it's also important in understanding what exactly is being bought and sold when you're paying for labor. Because there is this subjective dimension, these sort of internal or intrinsic things that can't be separated from you. So your powers that you bring to bear on the world. So your, your in a sense, your labor uh, is not something that can be literally separated from you. And so that leads me to to suggest that what is actually being sold is the change that you bring about in the world. So, for example, you know, I need someone to do some landscaping, and so I have an ugly yard, and so then they bring in equipment and everything, and they realize some sort of change. They make it different. And so with that, um, that is what I'm paying for. And one of the ways that you can kind of see this, uh, kind of thinking about it in terms of, you know, skill, for example, is that it doesn't matter so much the skill of the worker if, if that change is the same and the final result is the same, then I would pay the same for it. Because what I'm paying for is the, the actual change in the world, regardless of that, that person's skill in, in acting it. So um, now when I go to look for someone, I'm going to look for someone with a particular skill level. But I'm doing that because that skill is uh, indicative 
of the ability to realize that change in the world. So I think really it's that change in the world that is really what we're paying for. It's something that we can actually alienate from that person and the laborer. And also kind of along that lines, so like my yard, I own my yard. And in a sense, there is the potential for it to be, you know, that nice landscaped environment. And I own that potential. So when the the uh, landscaper realizes that, he has realized something that in a sense already at least virtually belonged to me. So what what really is his in, entirely? So he, what belongs to him is actually the the change itself, I think, because ultimately that change, the what he did to bring bring it from an ugly lawn to a beautiful lawn, the change that is something that is entirely his own, and so he has. And ultimately, he has some sort of stake in that final product. And so I think he has a claim to that. And from that claim, I think that's where the the wages come in. So there, there's a, so we're not paying for anything intrinsic. We're paying for really this change in the world. And to some extent, you know, the final product. It's not totally his because... Um, you know, I I own the, the lawn, you know, when you, for example, when you pay landscapers, you have to pay them for any, you actually have to pay for the material. So the material becomes yours, but then they, you know, bring about some state of affairs or, you know, order it in a particular way. And I think that's where the, the labor comes in. And so one of the things here, though, that I also wanted to kind of bring up uh, because I, I think this helps, you know, start to clarify um, what are wages, why are we paying for them, and so forth. But there, there, I think is a, a maybe a fundamental difference between hiring someone to, you know, do your landscaping at your your home, so do some sort of particular project, but then, for example being the owner of the landscaping company who actually employs that person. So the difference I think really is like when you hire, you know, a landscaper or an artisan or, or, or something like that. So they offer some sort of service at a price. And the, the difference I see here is there's some sort of limited scope. So they're trying to complete some sort of, definite project for you and so you don't kind of bring them into you don't integrate them into this the common good of your household for example they're just completing this this one good for you and then you're paying them for that whereas when you have an employee really what that person is doing is that they're entering into the common good of this business and they're really tying their livelihood in a sense to this business because they're seeking to um, obtain you know a living from it and so there's this more integration and I think this is really where a family wage becomes much more uh, obvious because you be by being integrated into that you are being united to it and so there has to be a greater concern for this person who is engaging in this common good whereas when you're just buying some service from this person there's a couple of issues so you know you're kind of still separated but also there's a sense in which I don't know what this, you know, I don't have sufficient knowledge to determine what this person needs because he's not kind of integrated in that same sense. 
and so I should pay him a fair wage for his work, but I don't have sort of even the knowledge to understand what would be a family wage for him, for example. So I think when you make that move from like an artisan who's, you know, taking his own livelihood into his own hands to an employee, there's a difference in our relationship there that requires you to start asking what is the the personality, what is the requirements of this and this relationship. And so I think that's that really provides more of a fundamental basis for a family wage. And really then, you know, the cost of goods should really be determined from that rather than the cost of goods from the market determines what you can pay your your people. So that's a few of my thoughts. I may be completely wrong about this, so feel free to comment below, uh, share your thoughts, email me, whatever. I'm still trying to think through this. So um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me, and uh, have a nice day.